This is TTT Live. I'm DK Rostar. The Ministry of Health is giving an update on the status of COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. We're bringing you live coverage on TTT, Talk City 91.1 FM, Sweet 100.1 FM, Next 99.1 FM, and on Facebook at TTT Live Online. We go now to the manager, Corporate Communications at the Ministry of Health, Candice Alcantara. It's a pleasure to be here with you again at the Ministry of Health's virtual media conference where we continue to update you on the ministry's COVID-19 response. Today on our panel, we have the Honorable Terence Dayalsing, Minister of Health, and Dr. Avery Hines, Technical Director of the Epidemiology Division. I am Candice Alcantara, Manager Corporate Communication at the Ministry, your moderator. The Honorable Terence Dayal Singh, Minister of Health, will open the proceedings this morning. Thank you very much, Candice. Good morning to Dr. Hines. Good morning to ladies and gentlemen of the media and all uh, persons listening on the different platforms. A very good morning to you on Saturday, 3rd October. Today marks our first press conference since the month of October has started. And what I'm hoping to do from today, um, and we discuss this with everyone at the ministry, in order to achieve our strategic objective of moving the country from community spread uh, back to cluster spread, we have to pay even more attention to our numbers, what do the numbers mean, and where the new cases are. I am reasonably happy this morning that we have some numbers which indicate that we are on the start of a right trend downwards with the numbers. Dr. Hines will go into that in detail, but there seems to be at this time about a 35% decrease in the numbers, which is good. And I think all citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, because this is your, I don't want to use the word, um, victory, but this is your accomplishment. Because we could not have achieved this downturn in numbers, which we hope will develop into a permanent trend, without members of the public in both islands wearing their masks, social distancing, washing their hands, staying home if you are ill. So we have some reasonably encouraging numbers to talk about this morning. What is happening globally? The pandemic shows no signs of a global slowdown. There are 34,788,605 cases globally. The daily average of 300,000 cases per day has remained constant since August 19th to September the 30th. So these numbers I am giving you are up to or, uh, September the 30th. The number of deaths has regrettably crossed the millionth mark. It is now 1,032,163. And the daily death toll from August 9 to September 30th, which is the figures I am giving, still hovers above 5,000 a day with no signs of decreasing. Our deepest condolences go out to the 78 uh, persons in Trinidad and Tobago who have succumbed. Um, and our deepest condolences again go out to them. But we are starting to see some positive signs and we want this to continue as we report to you these uh, figures, not only on a daily basis, but what you will start to see from today is a sort of a weekly review. So this drop in cases is to be congratulated to all members of the public who worked with us. I just want to close off briefly with where we are with the flu vaccination drive, because what we are trying to do, um, the global community is now adopting this word of a twindemic. We are trying to avoid a twindemic in both deaths due to COVID and seasonal influenza. So the annual flu shot drive is annual, it's every year. Whether you had a shot last year or earlier this year, you still need a new one. We distributed into the system 22,000 doses. 
So far, up to um, the latest figures I have, we have given out 3,934 doses. Our target per week is 10,000 doses per week for the first six weeks. And we are especially encouraging the following three categories of persons to get vaccinated. One, our healthcare workers. Two, our elderly, especially those of you with diabetes, hypertension, the sedentary ones, uh, pe persons with cancer, and what we call the comorbidities. And lastly, very importantly, our pregnant women. Please get vaccinated. We want to get up to about 10,000 doses per week. And the last figure I have is 3,934. So we need to pre double two and a half times that. It's free. It's available at a range of health centers that is on our website. We have also published it. So make use of this free flu vaccine so we could avoid what is being called a twindemic. Thank you very much, Candice. Thank you very much, Minister Dayal Singh. Dr. Avery Hines will now present the clinical and the epidemiological update. Good morning and thank you, Ms. Arkantara. Good morning to the Minister of Health. Good morning to the members of the viewing and listening public. The update for October the 3rd is as follows. To date, the number of samples submitted for testing has reached 32,122. Of those, 29,017 are unique tests completed for individual patients. The number of repeated tests stands at 3,105, and the number of samples testing positive stands at 4,709. There are currently 1,829 cases considered active in the uh, various parts of the healthcare system, whether it is home isolation or at hospitalized, hospitalized institutions. There have been 78 deaths, and again, we, can, we extend our condolences to the bereaved family members. The number of persons discharged from the public health facilities stands at 1,086, and the number of recovered community cases is 1,716. Of the 80 additional persons who would have tested positive between the last update and today, those individuals will now be processed for admission at the clinical discretion of the CMOs each under whom they fall. Uh, we do have a breakdown of the individuals who are currently institutionalized. The institutionalized individuals are in two, uh, set, two settings. One is the hospital setting where we have 103 patients spread across the Coover, Cora, uh, Rima, St. Anne, Scarborough facilities. And we have 13 individuals in the transition or step-down facilities spread across UE Debe and in Tobago. Of the two additional deaths which we would have announced today, subsequent to the last update, one individual was an elderly male and another was an elderly female with what we refer to as pre-existing conditions, pre-existing chronic disease conditions, and that brings the total to 78, as the minister would have alluded to. That, in brief summary, brings me to the end of the clinical update. We would now like to move on to the epidemiologic update, where there are a few slides that we would like to present. So, set next slide, please. As usual, we have our epidemic curve showing the samples by date of collection. We will circle back to discuss this in a little more detail, but let's move to the next slide. What we do see on the epidemic curve is the continuing trend in a downward direction when we look at the number of samples testing positive grouped by the date on which the samples were collected. So the black line that we do see uh, moving across the colored bars is what we call a trend line. It looks at the average number of cases over a pre-existing period, approximately of seven days, and we do see that that downward trend continues, and we're hoping that the behaviors that we have been encouraging will be continued so that the downward trend in numbers of infection can follow suit. Next slide. 
we have an additional slide, and this just shows the total numbers of cases that would have been reported aggregated on a weekly basis. And the important bit of this is showing the same trend line and the same shape of the trend where we would initially have risen to a peak and at the last couple of weeks, because this is a week by week graph, we have seen a week on week decrease of approximately 35% between week before last and now and last week and this week. So we're hoping that that trend continues. Next slide. We now have the demographics looking at age and sex distribution. Next slide. And uh, the age and sex distribution basically stand as we have previously seen with the majority of the cases in that 25 to 49 year age group. One thing I'd like to point out on this is the relative quote-unquote sparing of the younger age groups where we see that the pyramid is constricted, it's narrower at the bottom, there's smaller numbers at the bottom, and that constriction actually does indicate that some of the activities, the actions that we have taken to protect school children and school age children by sequestering them have had the desired effect of reducing rates in those age groups. Next slide. The slide on the fatalities emphasizes what we've always emphasized, which is that the majority of those who have passed on have been males, have been in the older age groups, 60 and above, carrying the majority of those deaths, and the under 50 age group really carrying only about 13.2% of the deaths. But we do want to emphasize that that does not mean that persons under 50 should not be concerned about clinical outcomes, and we want to encourage everyone who has respiratory symptoms, especially if you're diagnosed with COVID-19, to take your symptoms seriously and to take any worsening of symptoms seriously so that you can be appropriately dealt with by the health system. Next slide. The geographic distribution is as follows. Next slide. We do see the... Uh, established pattern of clustering throughout the population centers, East-West Corridor, Rima, Sangre Grande, San Fernando. We also see the additional uh, distribution of cases in the more rural areas, in the eastern areas, which initially was not a feature of the geographic distribution. So we want to emphasize that everyone across the country needs to continue to take the precautionary measures to reduce the risk of spread. And to look at it a slightly different way, next slide. If we look at the distribution in sort of a heat map, this map shows even geographic areas. So not communities, as the previous one would have showed, but basically a certain square kilometerage and a number of cases in that geographic area, with the dark blue being the the... Well, the darkest blue being no cases. The dark blue being the smallest number of cases, and as you go from blue to red, you see that you have more cases per unit area. This uh, distribution shows that, again, we have the greatest number of cases, the greatest concentration in the urban areas, but we're seeing increasing distributions in that rural setting, in the along country roads. So we do want to, again, encourage all individuals to maintain the, uh, hold the fort, maintain the behaviors that will prevent the spread of COVID-19. I'd like just to go back to the slide with the epidemic curve. And I'd like to go back to that for one simple reason. So if we can pull the epi curve back up, that was slide number three, I believe. Uh, the thing that we want to point out about the epi curve is that there seems to be a little misunderstanding, not the slide before that one, there seems to be a little misunderstanding about the use of some of the tools at our disposal. So we just want to take the opportunity to point out that while this tool is the best for showing the temporal distribution of cases, this is not the tool that we use to quantify the total number of cases that we have. As public health practitioners, we sit at the nexus of data analytics and clinical practice and public health practice, and we utilize a wide range of tools that are at our disposal. The EpiGov gives us a better idea of when cases may have showed up in the health system in a temporal fashion, and this curve shows a shape, a pattern 
that allows us to understand when we would have had the highest levels of activity and when those levels of activity would have begun to decline. Again, the numbers, the absolute numbers represented on this curve, because this was actually generated from a separate data source using corroborating information, that separate data source would allow us to see whether the trends that we would have been observing in numbers of cases being confirmed positive on a daily basis correspond with what's happening in the general population and that is the purpose of utilizing this day-by-day uh, -day breakdown. But the utilization of that to quantify or the the approach of looking at the numbers as being different from the total numbers of cases that that have been reported is basically a misunderstanding of how we utilize the tools at our disposal. As a clinician would, we would use our thermometers for temperature, we'd use our blood pressure machines to check blood pressure, we'd do blood tests to see what's going on with, with your, your blood count, white cells, red cells, etc. In a similar fashion, we utilize different tools for different purposes to get an idea of the overall story and an idea of the trend in the, uh, the evolution of the epidemic. So I'm hoping that that's a little clearer. We'll be happy to clarify further during the question and answer section. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. And we move to the question and answer segment. Members of the media, you're reminded, please two brief questions and to state your name and the name of the media house that you represent. We begin this morning with questions from TV6, please. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Avery Hines. Um, can the apex of the trend line in the epic curve be attributed to any public event? Um, and can months and dates be attached to the trend line to give some clarity to behavior and movement over the months so that, um, you know, going forward, we will know what to do when another or if another pandemic ever comes around next five years? Okay, thank you for the question. I'm interested in your, your, your timing of the pandemic in a five-year time frame. We have no idea when pandemics will or will not occur or arise. Nonetheless, as we have repeatedly uh, described, the epic curve shows a relationship between behaviors and outcomes. We have described this relationship ad nauseum in the various uh, press conferences expressing concern about the levels of movement that would have occurred after restrictions had been put in place, after advice had been issued to reduce numbers of gatherings, to manage the social distancing, and after observing that none of those behaviors had been adhered to, especially in the first part of August. After that, what we saw in the epic curve is basically what was expected, what was predicted, and what was projected when we explained that we will see an increase in the numbers of cases as a result of behaviors that were demonstrated. A good thing about the epic curve, looking at the temporal distribution of cases, is that you're quite right. We can see when behaviors have the desired impact and when we're not having the desired impact and we need to encourage individuals to continue to follow the guidelines, the rules. And as you again rightly pointed out, in knowing what to do if we have another respiratory epidemic at any point in time, the adherence to the basic and simple instructions to reduce gatherings, to increase spacing, to cover faces, mouth and nose that is, with a mask of a particular sort, whether it is a double or triple layer cloth mask or a surgical mask, all of those instructions will, if followed, lead to the improved outcomes that we're hoping for. So I'm glad that you've actually tied the shape of the epic curve to the behaviors because it is one of the things that we utilize to see the relationships between behaviors and the clinical outcomes. So that was a very good question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. And we move now to Power 102. Good morning, Head Table. Kimberly D'Souza from Power 102 and Izzo Media. Um, Minister, I have just one question for you. I realize that the repeated tests have increased. I think we were at 30, 63 for a while, and we're now at 3105. I just wanted to know if there's an update on the number of test kits we have in the country in terms of the BGI and the Abbots and that sort of thing. Thanks. So I have that 
for you so let me get that to you now right so we have three types of test kits in the country BGI Abbott and test kits for the gene expert machines okay so for BGI we have 20,200 in stock now and we have an incoming shipment from Paho of 10,000 but then we also have a rolling order like every month for about 20,000 for the Abbott system we currently have 1920 and in the first week of October we which is now uh, between now and early next week we have 36,384 tests coming in and again we have a rolling order now for about 20,000 the gene experts uh, which we use very sparingly these are not used for large numbers they are used mainly in Tobago and San Grande and some of the TPH lab in um, Sinclair there. We have 780 in stock. So currently <clears throat> we have 22,900 tests in stock across the three platforms and as I said we have rolling orders now every month for between 20 to 40,000 uh, test kits. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much, Minister. Ms. D'Souza, did you have a second question? Okay, seems not. And so we go to TTT, please. No, I don't. Yes, hi, good morning. Um, now, a 35%, sorry, Sonal Lala from TTT News. A 35% decrease in cases is quite a significant um, decrease. Uh, Minister, do you foresee the Prime Minister, I know you saw the hold a press conference again on October 10th, I believe. Uh, do you believe this would influence his decision-making going forward? And my second question, I, I've gotten a question from someone who wants some clarification on non-contact sports. Um, they're asking, does it mean that one-on-one -on -one swimming and gymnastic classes are allowed, um, where there's only one instructor and one child with no physical contact in a private pool? Okay, so thank you for your question. So the Honourable Prime Minister will make those determinations as to what is opened up uh, or not opened up as the case may be next week. Um, I will not uh, preempt his decision. What I will say his decision making so far has been absolutely spot on. But what we will look at, and as public health um, persons will tell you, the more you open up and the more people move, we need to have even more compliance with the public health measures if we are to open up more and more. So we await the Honorable Prime Minister's decision. On the issue of um, sports, all contact sports, um, like cricket, football, team sports, are not allowed at this point in time. Um, public pools are closed off. So if someone has a private pool, um, they are allowed to be in their private pool. So if one person wants to swim in their private pool, as far as I am aware, that is allowed under the regulations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. And now we are ready to take questions from AZP News, please. Hi, good morning, Prior Bihari, azpnews.com. Mister, I'm not sure if this, um, you, you can answer this question, but, but I have to ask it. Um, a number of employees who have, um, have to stay home because, you know, of contact tracing or, or because one um, of their colleagues in, in their workplace um, um, had contracted the COVID-19. Some of them, when they go home, they are not being paid and they are having difficulties with their employers in terms of, of accessing salary and accessing the, the, the NIS benefits that they are allowed. Um, so they just wanted to know if um, that issue can, can be taken up, um, is there an issue um, we have had um, a number of complaints from um, from various organizations. One and the second question, I just want you wanted you to um, um, to elaborate a little bit on on the thirty five percent decrease in, in in cases. What what exactly does it mean? Does it mean um f since March to now we we have had a decrease? Um, can um, can you just explain exactly what that decrease is about? 
So Dr. Hines will take the second question. As far as your first question is concerned, this is an issue that I would not have information on, but I will surely pass it on to the relevant authorities. Dr. Hines. Okay, thank you for your question, Mr. Bihari. The 35% decrease that we were speaking about really referred to the graph that showed the cumulative numbers of cases on a weekly basis, comparing one week with the week just before it. And we were looking at the comparison between this week and last week, and the comparison between last week and the week before. And we saw that from last, from the week before to last week, we saw a 35% decrease. And this week seemed to set to end on a similar trend of another 35% decrease between last week and this one. So the 35% is really a week to week that we're speaking about at this point in time. Okay, thank you very much. And we're ready now for Newsday. Please pose your questions. Hi, good morning. General of from Newsday. The Council of Evangelical Churches has asked that the government recognize the importance of religious organizations, um, especially as um, the government noted that you know their importance when it came to the distribution of hampers and so forth. Um, do you have any response to that? And with the 35% decrease, do you think this could possibly be changed soon? Yes, so places of religion are very important, and religion is very important. The Honorable Prime Minister will make determinations next week as to what parts of the economy or the system that will be opened up. I will not preempt the decisions that the Honorable Prime Minister will make, but let me say he has guided this country brilliantly in making the decisions that have to be made to save lives and livelihood. That is what we are about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now CNC3, we are ready for your questions, please. Hi, good morning. This is Sweeney Gray from CNC3. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the length of time it will take, it takes a person to be tested currently under the system um, just an update on that, and yeah, that's, that's about it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So I will take that question. The testing procedure goes like this. One, you have to do a patient assessment and you have to do swabbing. Take some time. Two, the sample has to be transported to a testing site, whether it's at CARFA, TPHL, the North Central Regional Health Authority, or Southwest. You have to issue a receipt. The sample receipt has to be validated, it has to be registered, and then it has to be triaged. In other words, level of importance. Then you do the actual testing, validation, and reporting. Then you have to publish those reports, and then the patient has to be notified. So right now it's a six step stage. All in all, this takes us between 24 to 48 hours depending on volumes and so on. Outside of this, we also have the gene expert machines where you get your test results in a matter of hours. So there are two systems, the immediate results, low volume gene expert machines, you get your results literally in two to three hours. And then for the other machines, the other PCR machines, which are scattered throughout the country, it can take up to 24 to 48 hours, which is the ideal in keeping with international norms at this point in time. And I'm happy to report that we are now sticking to those times after we did have that uh, spike in August, September, where admittedly, and I apologize to the country for that, we were overwhelmed at that point in time. But if we continue on this trajectory, we will have absolutely no problems. Our current testing capacity is 1,277 per day. But that is running flat out. And you can't run any system flat out seven days a week. Systems will break down, people will break down, and you will bring errors into the system. I can tell you now, and I'm being upfront, one of our machines has to come off line for scheduled maintenance. 
So the machines need to be maintained. Sometimes software needs to be upgraded. So we have a capacity of 1,277, but it doesn't mean we can run this system uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's like a car. You can't run it at top speed from Port of Spain to San Fernando. It will blow up. So right now we're in a good space with between, I think, 400 to 600 tests a day, and we are comfortable with that load. And if the population continues to wear masks, sanitize, stay home if you are ill, we'll be in a very, very good place to turn around results. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. And we're always grateful for the benefit of technology. The media representative from uh, CL Communications, Ms. Singh, has submitted her question uh, because we did have some audio issues. And her question is as follows. Given that there are trends of downward statistics, does it mean that there will be a relaxing of some of the measures in place? This is from Ms. Singh from CL Communications. Okay, thank you, Ms. Singh. So, again, as we said this morning, the Honorable Prime Minister, after he meets with us, he announces in his best judgment, and his judgment has been sound so far, what measures will be taken at the end of this period, which comes in, and I believe, on October the 11th. So today is the uh, third, I believe. So we just have about another seven days to wait, but we are doing this in an effort, as I said, to save lives and livelihoods. Thank you, Minister. And we have a follow-up question from AZP News at this time. Yes, good morning again. Um, uh, Minister, the, the, the budget day is on Monday. Is there anything specifically you want, you know, to the priority from, from um, the Minister um, as you go forward in terms of, of, the, of the fight um, against COVID? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. You, you may recall prior that earlier, when the last budget was passed in 2019, I don't think anybody knew the word COVID. <laughs> so there was no budgetary approval for COVID. But when COVID hit us, you will recall, I did go to cabinet and I took a note to cabinet for an expenditure, well, not an expenditure, for a proposal that $157 million be made available to the four RHAs and the Ministry of Health for their COVID response. And that was outside of a budgetary approval. Tobago, in addition, got an additional $50 million outside of the THAs piece of the budget. So I could allay all fears. The Ministry of Health's COVID response by any mechanism will be well funded. Um, the preliminary figures that we ran, because we had to close off accounts, of the $157 million that Trinidad got, the four RHAs, I think we have spent so far $79 million of that 157 So have no fear, the country's COVID response will be financed, you know, out of recurrent or out of special allocations, as we have done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. And we go now to a follow-up question from TTT. Hi, good morning again. Sonal Lala from TTT News. Um, Minister, can we get an update on the antigen testing? Uh, when is that expected? And part B of that question, um, I'm seeing on uh, online, there is a, a medical institution, I would not call the name of it, uh, but they have uh, about six locations in Trinidad and Tobago. They are offering antibody testing I know with the PCR testing, they would have had to get uh, got approval to do so. Um, does that apply with the antibody testing as well? Right. Thank you very much, Sunil. So, we have ordered through PAHO 160,000 rapid antigen test kits. Um, the entire shipment is due for delivery by the end of October going into November. About two weeks ago, I reached out to PAHO, and this is where the difficulty lies, trying to get an expedited first batch. I said I would like to have about 20,000 up front. Um, the problem is to fly in, to hire a whole plane, uh, because transport, transport routes have been adversely affected due to COVID. 
uh, planes have to do what is called cargo consolidation. They are not going to fly in 20,000 kits into Trinidad alone. So we are trying to consolidate some cargo. PAHO is working with me to get an advanced shipment of 20,000 kits uh, before the estimated arrival of the whole batch of 160. But we are at the, I would say, we, we are constrained in how flights are coming into Trinidad and Tobago with less than economic cargo loads. Um, so we are working with that, but PAHO has, has assured me that by the end of October into early November, all the kits will be here, but I am working overtime to get 20,000 kits into the country beforehand. Dr. Hines will talk about the anti-body testing. Now, I'm going to address really this, the, the scientific principles behind the antibody versus the antigen testing. Antibody testing, as you will be aware, is the test that shows whether your body has generated an immune response to an infection. As a result, it is necessarily a delayed manifestation of your infection, and an antibody test will show up as negative in the initial phases of any acute viral illness. In fact, this antibody test that we're looking at, I think only begins to show positivity between 10 and 14 days after you have initially been infected. As such, it has its own place in the pantheon of the of the testing that we will do, but it is not the test that we will rely on for acute diagnosis. It is not the test that we will rely on to see whether currently ill people have COVID-19 or not. So it doesn't hold that level of priority. The test that we would use for that would be the ones that either detect the genetic material of the virus, those are the PCR tests, or some part of the virus's coating, those are the antigen tests. So in the scale of things, the PCR and the antigen testing are where the focus is, and antibody testing will be evaluated, validated, and then brought on stream as appropriate. Thank you very much. And CNC3, please pose your follow-up question at this time. Hi, thank you so much. Um, this is for Dr. Avery Hines. I just wanted to, I, I'm guessing this is who you were responding to when you explained that um, some people are misunderstanding the use of the EpiCo. I just wanted to get some clarity. So this data scientist from Ulytics, I think, um, is not seeing 1,200 cases. And I just wanted you to kind of explain how it is that he's misunderstanding the data and thinking that there are 1,200 persons that may be missing from the Ministry of Health um, reporting. Okay, I think the first bit of your question actually answers itself. If we are aware that there are 1,200 cases that you are not seeing in one particular graphic, it means that you're aware of the cases, so they're not missing we have a full count of all the cases that have been diagnosed. The point that we were making with the epi curve is that we utilize another subset of data, a separate data source to corroborate. This is what we do in epidemiology and public health. We utilize data from multiple sources to get an understanding of temporal patterns in disease occurrence. So the epi curve, while it comes from a different data source, it corroborates, it has the same overall shape and pattern as the total number of tests that we have been reporting on a daily basis. The total number of tests had a particular challenge in the time frame when there was a backlog in the testing that gave the shape of the graph a misleading sort of contour and gave the idea that a a particular point in time may have been the peak, whereas that point in time, when you look at the, the epidemiologic curve, was actually earlier on in the process. So when we look at the epidemiologic curve, the epidemic curve, what we're looking for with this data source is not to quantify all the cases. We've already done that. That's already been reported. The curve is then utilized to give a better understanding of when cases would be occurring, when declines would have begun to be seen. So you're not having the impression that the the cases are speeding up when they're actually beginning to slow down. So the epi curve helps you to understand when in time cases would have occurred. It helps you to understand a pattern. 
but it's not the, the tool that we're using to give the full numbers. So there are no missing cases. The cases have been reported. The epic curve then shows you a pattern. It gives you a better idea of when that would have happened using a corroborating data source. I'm hoping that clarifies better. Thank you very much. And today we introduce a new segment. We will respond to questions that you, members of the public, have submitted to us via telephone, email, and social media messaging. Our first question. I need a fit for work document for my job. Where can I get this? Okay, I'll take that first question. There are two sets of pathways that people will utilize to return to work, and they come from the two circumstances under which people would have been kept at home. Individuals who were diagnosed with COVID-19 and who were isolated at home will get from their CMO's H a document that says that they have now cleared that infectious period and are fit to return to work. The individuals who were in contact with them but were not diagnosed and were not ill are issued something called a quarantine form or quarantine certificate, which indicates the duration for which they are expected to remain away from work. So that's a self-limiting document. That document in and of itself indicates the date on which you become fit for work once more. So a separate fit for work document isn't actually required, but you can always liaise with the CMOH office which had issued the fit for work if you're having a difficulty, if you need to explain that to the employers in some other language. They may, you may have assistance from your CMOH or one of the representatives to make that a little clearer. Thank you very much, Dr. Hines. Another question that we get very often, it's about mask wearing. Should masks be worn with shields? Okay, again, I'll take that one. Ideally, we want to have the holes in your face, the nose and mouth covered by a mask to prevent the expulsion of droplets. The legal uh, framework that we have for face coverings allows for both masks and the shields either or but if you want to optimize then yes it would be recommended that you do wear a mask even if you're wearing a shield but either is legally acceptable we just want to encourage persons to the greatest extent possible to use a mask which adds a literal extra layer of protection okay thank you and uh, the final question from the public this morning. Should a person isolate, self-isolate or self-quarantine only if they are instructed to do so by the Ministry of Health? Okay, I'll take question number three as well. I think this is an excellent question. <laughs> it gives the opportunity to point out that no, you don't only wait for an instruction to isolate. If you have symptoms, if you have any sort of respiratory or viral symptoms, we would like you to initiate your self-isolation even as you reach out to the health system for your assessment. So you don't have to wait for an instruction to tell you don't go to work, don't go out into public places. You begin that isolation as a responsible member of the public. And as a responsible yep. member of the public, you also reach out to ensure that you get assessed and reduce your risk of any adverse outcomes. So no, you don't wait. You do self-isolate initially, but don't self-isolate and fail to reach out. Don't forget that you also need to make sure that you are assessed. So you don't self-isolate and, and isolate yourself from the system the health system, you isolate yourself from getting into contact with individuals whom you might make ill. So thank you for that question. Okay, thank you very much. And we're coming to the end of this morning's press conference. We just want to confirm that our members of the media have no more questions today because we are ready to come to the end. And I think we've given everyone an opportunity to indicate. Everyone is very clear. Thank you very much for your participation today. And we conclude with a video from head nurse Renee Solomon, one of the dedicated healthcare workers at Cora Hospital. Be safe, everyone. COVID-19 is here and has become everyone's business. 
is not a respecter of age, race, gender, one's financial educational status, or mental and physical ability. Therefore, it is our duty to prevent the spread of this virus in our communities. We all have a part to play with this pandemic. Therefore, there's so many things we can do. First of all, we can wear our mask, practice good hand hygiene, that is washing your hands and hand sanitizing, as well as maintaining the social distancing at least six feet apart. Added to that, you can eat well, rest well, hydrate well, ensure that you maintain your immune boosters by taking multivitamins. We, the frontline healthcare workers, need you to help us with this fight. To those suffering with predisposed and health conditions like asthma, diabetes, hypertension, renal disease, autoimmune disease, just to name a few, take your medications as recommended by your health physician. Families, friends, I urge you to ensure that their supply is adequate. Do not let it finish. Also, take your recommended diet as per health condition. Do not cheat, for to cheat means that you put your body in a difficulty to cope. To those persons living with depression, other health and mental health and emotional health conditions, self-quarantine is a difficult time. We know and understand this. I urge families and loved ones to check up on them regularly send a voice note, make a phone call, extend your love, care and support to them as they do need your care and support at this time. To the youths of Trinidad and Tobago, do not think for one minute that you are exempted from this virus. I urge you to encourage good behavior amongst your peers. Do exercise good health practice and also ensure that you exercise the preventative health measures in this pandemic implemented for your benefit. I must add, in support of my health studies, we are committed to ensuring that you receive the delivery of care that is necessary to aid a speedy recovery for those who end up with this virus. Do act responsibly. Ensure that you maintain good health practices. Protect yourself and in so doing, protect your loved ones. For prevention is so much better than cure. As a father and a husband, I believe it is my role to protect my family. As a Trinbegonian, I also have a responsibility to my fellow men. We can't protect our loved ones and our country from COVID-19 if we all wear a mask over our nose and mouth in public.